Alright, Masters of the Universe Classics fans, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick here, back with another director's commentary, and this time the last 2009 figure, the Green Goddess, or otherwise just known as the Goddess. I guess it could be both, but on packaging she was just called the Goddess. A lot of fans call her the Green Goddess, but hey, it's not my place to argue. So who is the Green Goddess, and why did we do her as a figure? Well, she was a lot about what Moji Classics was all about, was doing figures based on concept art, and prototypes, and unused concepts from the vintage line. In this case, the Green Goddess was a character from the vintage mini-comics who gave He-Man all of his special equipment. And granted, you know, this was in the uh, Don Glute mini-comics, which were a little different. This was before DC came along and rewrote a lot of stuff, introducing Prince Adam. Back in those comics, He-Man was just from the Jungle Tribe, and there was no Power Sword. Or at least it wasn't kind of the same Power Sword. And so this character, Green Goddess, or just the Goddess, as she was called in the mini-comic, was the one who sort of took the role of the Sorceress and gave Jungle He-Man, or that the He-Man who came from his jungle tribe, all of his, his shield and his sword. And she was essentially a... Well, she became a repaint of Tila, but that's not who she originally was. A lot of people, and even toy companies over the years, have kind of used Goddess as just an excuse to issue Tila in a new color. Because, I mean, anytime you can take a toy tool, a mold, and issue it in a new color, that's a great way to save on money. But it's not quite right. I mean, yes, you can use the Tila buck and color it green and, and do the goddess, but the goddess has kind of become her own character, especially, I think, since we did this figure. She was pr featured prominently in some of the new DC comics in the last few years. And, yeah, I kind of think the fact that we did this figure had a lot to do with that because it really brought her out of obscurity and created what's called permanence, which means it's not just a passive entertainment like a comic or a movie where you're sitting and reading or watching, but a more active form of entertainment, action figure collecting or action figure playing, where you have the figure and you're, you, know, you, can, you can control how it looks and, and, and how it's posed. And uh, so you know, she was a follow-up to Tila, especially in the sense that we tooled her staff at the same time as Tula, as Tula, as Tila, so that we could release her as a nether test, as we did with Zodak with a K before her, to see if the Motu Classics audience was big enough to support more than one figure per month. We thought they were, and the way to test this was to put out two non-tooled figures, the first being Zodak, and the second being Goddess, where she was a repaint of Tila with a new accessory. But again, much like Zodak, we tooled her staff, her original accessory, with Tula. Tula. I said it again, with Tila. I gotta stop doing that. Um, so that made it a straight repaint, no new tooling. So a little bit more about her history. So back again in the Don Glute mini comics, you had Tila, and she was, you know, the warrior character. She had blonde-er hair, and her role was basically smashing bad guys along with He-Man and a lot of sword play, and sometimes getting captured by bad guys, etc. The goddess, on the other hand, this is her most famous panel, she was the one who gave He-Man his accessories, and they wanted to include her in the toy line, as well as include Tila. And there was kind of a very interesting and clever way that they did that. So, the goddess character, who was often, was often, also, boy, I'm not doing too well tonight, uh, shown with Caucasian skin in more of her Tila outfit, well, this kind of came from some of the confusion because of how she was released. The original intent, and especially if you go back to looking at the original concept art, was there were going to be two female characters released in the original rollout. You were going to have the Tila character, who was called the Warrior, and you know you can see her here with all of her battle gear, and then you were going to have a second character called the Goddess, who was going to be more of a mystical character. Now, those two characters got combined as one single release, and that's why Tila is called the Warrior Goddess, because she was originally two completely separate characters that got merged into one. The goddess character eventually 
became the sorceress, especially once Filmation came along, but fulfilled that role of sort of guide for He-Man. So here is the vintage Tigla figure, you know, again, where she's called the warrior goddess. And the idea was she was going to be a twofer, basically, for Mattel. Instead of putting out a warrior and a goddess figure, they only were going to put out one figure. So without the armor, without the snake armor, you would be able to get the warrior, which was a you know, t- named Tila. Check out the Tila video, talk more about that. She's named after an elephant. So this was Tila and as a warrior. And then by putting the armor on her and giving her the snake staff, she became the goddess. So this was supposed to be a completely different character. It was not supposed to be Tila with snake armor. This was supposed to be the goddess figure. And the reason they were combined is, well, female action figures don't sell that well because it's a boy's play pattern. You can see the video here where I talk about that. Yes, we all love female figures from a collector standpoint, and that's why we had a lot in Motu Classics because it was only aimed at adults. But for a toy line named at kids, female figures just don't sell as well. This is maybe how she would have looked had they released her in the vintage line as a separate figure and not gone for like a twofer, which I think most kids kind of missed that, that it was supposed to be the goddess and Tila by, you know, like you could have almost bought two of them, if you will, and had two different characters in your collection. It was essentially, you know, to minimize the amount of female figures that they expected kids to buy. Because, hey, if you're going to buy a female, let's at least make her, you know, two different characters. It's like having a head swap these days, you know, where, where a character might come with two different heads and be two different agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or something like that. So in the mini comics here, eventually they kind of explained this away and they had the goddess or eventually sorceress and Tila split apart as two different characters. It was some weird, you know, retconning, and it was, I mean, you know, it's one of those things that just sort of got to grin and bear it. But the comic basically made them separate characters, and now you had Tila, and you had the goddess, and they were completely different, no confusion whatsoever, except for the fact that the goddess eventually became the sorceress. But... With Masters of the Universe Classics, the idea was to kind of pay homage to everything, and that meant it would be a great idea to do a goddess figure. We even put some art of her up on our fan panel at New York Comic Con to show the potential of the line, of like how deep we wanted to get. All right, and taking note of her accessories, the fact that she came with He-Man's armor, axe, and shield, this was one of the longest payoffs I think I've ever gotten to work on. And I'll explain that. So this is the character eventually released as Ular, who is just the jungle He-Man, the guy who's like, bye-bye, jungle tribe, I'm off to go save Eternia. Goodbye. Good luck. You think it'll take a miracle? I'm doing a terrible Miracle Max there. All right, so he goes off and and, and tries to save Eternia, and on his way meets the goddess who gives him his, his armor and accessories, as noted earlier. So the one of the reasons we had Goddess come with the armor is I had high hopes that one day we would be able to get to this figure, a jungle He-Man. And the armor that came with the Goddess was meant for this figure. And I couldn't believe we actually paid this off because when we got to the figure, you'll note he does not come with He-Man's armor, axe, or shield because the armor, axe, and shield that came with the goddess was intended for him. And this was one of, I think, I don't know, it was a huge victory, I I thought, like being able to pull this off, because we set the stage to do this figure in 2009 with the goddess figure, and finally got to pay it off by not having him have the armor, and having the armor be with the goddess figure. I I was really proud of that. I just, you know, being able to be on the line as long as I was allowed you know, me to have the opportunity to do things like this. And, you know, I think it's rare for a brand to have a brand manager that lasts almost a decade. But things like this get to happen when you have, like, sort of, you know, one marketing guy leading the train for that long. So I was really proud of this sort of Ular goddess connection. They kind of bookended the whole line with her at the very beginning and him kind of towards the very end of the line. And, uh, yeah, I was proud of that. All right, I think I covered this enough. Let's talk about another issue with the goddess. 
the elephant in the room and not snout spout, I'm talking about the issue with the legs. And I'm not talking about the vintage figures whose legs used to break when the rubber band would break. I'm talking about the fact that, yes, the goddess figure often had her limbs sort of chip off and break off. And obviously, this was not intentional. And a lot of fans sort of jumped to the conclusion that this was because the plastic used, because the original horseman sculpt that was shown at the convention was not clear, and we made her clear to further you know, make her visually look different from Tila. So a lot of people said, oh, you used clear plastic, clear, you know, that must be why it broke, because it's, it's cheap plastic. And honestly, that is just not true. I mean, clear figures are done all the time in action figures from different companies and you know they're done in different scales sometimes they have a little bit of paint on them sometimes they have no paint on them they've been done by big companies they've been done by small companies doing clear figures is almost kind of a, a staple of the action figure industry in fact we even you know did other clear figures in the bastards of the universe classics line the notorious uh, cherry popsicle hordak and, you know, he didn't have any problem with limbs breaking off. And the reason for that is because it was not cheap, inexpensive plastic. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with a thing called the Sonic Welder, which is a device the vendors use to sort of seal the joints of figures. And at a certain time in production, when Goddess was being made, the, vet, the Sonic Welder was off. There was some problem with it. And it was causing microscopic tears in the plastic. This is why it happened. We caught it very quickly. We immediately had the vendor change things. But because Motu Classics figures had such a low run, we couldn't stop it in time for you know to, to sort of save Goddess. As proof in the pudding, you will note that other figures that Mattel made with the same vendor at the same time, like DCU Classics Wave 6, which came out at the same time, also had the same problem, and this character, the Superman character, did not have clear plastic, but the same problem happened because of the sonic welder. Now, the long run was to fix this and to kind of correct this. In the 2016 line, uh, the other video about the history of Maddie, I talk about this, we did have planned a Green Goddess 2.0. The idea was to, you know, do a fully tooled or a, a new version of her. And this would also give us parts to make a new Tila as well, so it was kind of another twofer. But uh, that never happened for a variety of reasons, but other companies still kind of jumped on the Tila goddess bandwagon. I did think it was a little odd when, with the green skin, she was still called Tila on package, but hey, you know, everyone has their own approach. Now, we really wanted to make the goddess her own character, and you know that was why her bio really established her as different from the sorceress, different from Tila, and we called her Shirella, her real name. That was a nod to a Preternia character. So on the Megator box, only released in Europe, you will see at the very bottom there is a female archer character who some people kind of thought might have been Hero's girlfriend, and she was called Shirella. So we thought, well, let's expand on this and make the green goddess this character who, you know, have Shirella eventually become the goddess and, you know, kind of connect Preternia to current Eternia time. And that was where that came from. It was it was the whole idea of using the bios to kind of tie up, I wouldn't call them loose ends in the continuity, but at least to connect things together. Uh, trying to create, you know, one cohesive world where you could have the goddess and Tila and the sorceress and everybody exist, you know, all together. And like I said, she became an easy repaint. Uh, you know, I think what Super 7 did was great. You know, they, they had tons of different ways they did the Tila buck. Because yes, once you tool a figure, you want to get the maximum use out of it. Goddess also would pop up in things like the Mega Bloks line. Uh, you know, again, easy repaint of Tila, and that's cool. It's like how Faker is an easy repaint of He-Man. Anytime you can do repaints, it's awesome. And she's become a character of her own. She's now part of pop culture, and that's really cool. And I think this figure had a lot to do with that and has now made her more than just a Tila repaint, but a true character who can now live on and kind of claim her own spot in the Masters of the Universe world. It was really fun to include her.